Um, welcome to the 37th annual uh, Vancouver International Film Festival. So we are on uh, day nine of 16, so we're over halfway there, and believe me, that's a good thing. And um, I'd like to thank all of the volunteers for hanging in there with us for the past nine days and um, seeing what the next six will bring us. So um, thank you for all of your hard work in getting us this far. Um, and that's a big thank you to a thousand plus volunteers, if you can believe it. So just a, a quick round of applause for the volunteers. Uh, I'd like to start this morning by acknowledging that we're very fortunate to be here today on the unceded territories of the Squamish, Musqueam, and Sable-Tooth First Nations. My name is Jacqueline Dupuy, and I'm the Executive Director of the VIF Society. I'd like to welcome you to our third annual Sustainable Production Forum. We are absolutely delighted that you're all here to participate in the knowledge sharing on sust sustainability in the motion picture uh, industry, and of course, a topic uh, of our industry that touches absolutely everyone. I'd like to take a moment before we begin to thank uh, our presenting sponsors, Creative BC. And of course, with the support of the Motion Picture Industry Association, Tourism Vancouver, and Bridge Studios, thank you to everyone for helping to make this possible. We've also worked over the past year with uh, Real Green and a number of advisors to help us um, further shape the program over the next three years to see what that will look like. And of course, um, uh, devise a strategy to encourage participation from around the world. So that's a little bit of what you can look forward to in the, in the coming years. Um, certainly in BC, we've had a very uh, busy year. Um, to give you some context about our industry locally, in the fiscal 2017-2018, uh, we had 452 productions of various sizes filmed here, employing over 60,000 crew, so it's been a very busy year. Of course, a lot of logistics and resources go into making those productions, uh, and then of course that creates a lot of opportunity for our local industry to make a difference in terms of sustainability. So, and I know they do, and, um, and that's why we're here today. So at VIF, not only does sustainable production al align with our values as an organization and as an industry uh, partner, but we acknowledge that as a festival, we do have the opportunity to play a, a key role in advancing the sustainable production agenda by providing an international platform uh, to gather and explore at all levels uh, with multiple perspectives and, of course, stakeholders from around the world. So you are here today because you are a change maker and you've come to learn and participate and generate ideas for how you can implement sustainable practices when you get back to set or back to your office and we're really happy that you're here with us today to be able to do that. As you know, climate change is the number one threat facing humanity and it's critical that the motion picture industry adapt and reduce its impact. Um, and I'm reminded, uh, about, um, reminded by what Chris Carter said uh, of the X-Files the first year that we launched uh, the Sustainable Production Forum, um, and I'm paraphrasing here, but uh, it was something like, we make uh, luxury good entertainment, uh, referring to entertainment, of course, and he said, we must make it with as little harm as possible, and if we want to continue, we need to transform our culture towards sustainability. So we're going to be building on that. Uh, we've been building on that quote for the last couple of years, and we're going to be further building on that today. Um, we will also set out to celebrate, finally, this is a very exciting addition to the Sustainable Production Forum. We're going to celebrate those who work hard to implement sustainable production practices uh, with the launch of our first ever Sustainable Production Excellence Awards. Um, the presentation is going to happen tonight after uh, the program at the reception, and we hope you'll all have a chance to, uh, to meet the winners and celebrate their efforts. And of course, we'll continue to work toward our ambitious goals to increase geographical and broad stakeholder participation to provide you with thought-provoking content that inspires you to take action. So I welcome you all here. Um, we're going to be exploring the theme of transforming culture. I know it's going to be an exciting couple of days, and I'd like to thank you for joining us on this journey. Now, just before we dive in, I'd like to introduce you to Zena Harris, the mastermind of our program here uh, at the Sustainable Production Forum. Uh, Zena is the president of the Green Spark Group, the only sustainable 
so, sorry, the only sustainability consultancy in, in British Columbia dedicated to the implementation of sustainable production practices in the motion picture industry. Xena works with studios such as 20th Century Fox, NBC Universal, and Amazon. I just got an email to implement this is the downside of reading from a. Um, now we know why we don't why we don't read from our. Anyway, to implement sustainable production practices in film and television shows. Um, it wasn't important. We, <laughs> we've seen uh, Xena on the big screen and behind this in behind the scenes videos in the X-Files with Fox, Legion, and, uh, and with, FS, with FX and, Mar and Marvel. Um, and she continues to inspire us all. Uh, additionally, Xena teaches courses and consults with organizations such as Creative BC and the Real Green Partners. Um, and Xena holds a master's degree from Harvard University in sustainability and environmental management. Can I Anybody else in this room say that? It's pretty darn impressive, my dear. <laughs> so we're thrilled to have Zena as our curator for the Sustainable Production Forum, and you're in very good hands over the next couple of days, and I'd like to just turn it over to Zena at this moment. Thank you, Zena. <laughs> Did you want David, or? No, no. No, you're okay. I'm good. <laughs> we'll put him away again, then. Yeah. See Thank you. Um, well, thank you, Jacqueline, uh, and it's really great to be back at VIF again this year um, for two days of sustainable production discussions. Yay! Um, <laughs> we have a, a packed agenda for you over these next two days, uh, and it's so exciting to bring the industry this programming uh, that focuses on sustainability for the industry. Um, there are many aspects to the concept of sustainability, and I won't get into a lecture here about them all because I could talk forever um, about it. Um, but I will note that um, often um, when thinking about sustainability, um, we tend to narrow our focus to the environmental responsibility, um, but intertwined in environmental responsibility is the social component, um, the human component. And that is a key piece of it all. You may have heard uh, the saying that everything is connected. And I want to challenge you over the next couple of days um, to listen to these sessions with that idea in mind, that everything is connected. Um, and now I am really, really honored uh, to introduce our first speaker, Christina Mittemeyer. Christina is a virtuous mind and voice in conservation photography, and one of the most influential female photographers in the world. Christina has been hailed as one of the most important outdoor photographers of this generation. Christina first discovered her insatiable passion for the natural world, both above and below the surface. As a marine biologist working in the Gulf of California and Yucatan Peninsula, it didn't take her long to realize that she could make a bigger impact on how people see the world and connect to it through the lens of her camera than she could with data on spreadsheets. Today, Christina is a National Geographic photographer, co-founder, and vision lead of the Conservation Society Sea Legacy, a Sony artisan of imagery, the editor of 25 books on conservation issues, and is a sought-after keynote speaker and presenter. She founded the International League of Conservation Photographers. Christina is recognized as the National Geographic Adventure of the Year in 2018 and is acknowledged as one of the most influential women in ocean conservation in 2018 by Ocean Geographic. Her new fine art photography book, Amaze, is an inspiration for sustainable living with others and our environment that captures Christina's vision of creating a deeper sense of connection between humans and the environments that we live in. Please join me in welcoming Christina Mittemeyer. You know what, Zina? I would trade it all in for a master's degree from Harvard. <laughs> Seriously. Uh, good morning, everyone. Um, I come here today as a photographer, as a conservationist, but also as a local. I, I live on Vancouver Island. I consider myself a British Columbian. And as we feel this tension between industry and you know, supernatural British Columbia, I think it's going to be ever more important for this industry 
to play a huge role in creating jobs and bringing alternative economies to our province. And so we have to get it right from the onset. So thank you so much for making sure that we get it right as it grows and becomes the most important job creator for British Columbia. Um, before I tell you what I do, I'm going to show you how I do it. We can lower the house. Like Um, of course, I'm, my partner is an uh, amazing photographer and filmmaker, Paul Necklin, so I always have the best highlight reels. <laughs> um, I wanted to share with you a story this morning uh, because uh, now that I'm getting older and I'm getting all these awards, I have been forced to look back into my archive of images. And in doing so, I realized that some of the most important images that I've made in my career are the ones that I actually didn't make. 25 years ago, when I was a really young photographer getting that first break, that opportunity to go on assignment to the Amazon, I was sent to this small village in the middle of nowhere. To get there, you had to get on a plane from Miami, travel to Sao Paulo, and then to Manaus, and then the names become unrecognizable. You go to Heaven Sound, to Maraba, and the planes get smaller and smaller. Finally, you get on a small Cessna, fly three hours over unbroken Amazonian rainforest, that's my hair, sorry. Yeah, <laughs> thank you, Travis. And um, you land in this little village. It's called Kenjam, population 150. I was sent there by a conservation group that was mounting a campaign against a hydroelectric dam that was going to be built on the headwaters of the Shingu River, one of the most important tributaries of the Amazon. And this dam was not going to be an ordinary dam. It was going to be the third largest hydroelectric dam in the world and it was going to be affecting about 45,000 people, most of them indigenous communities, that lived along the edges of this river, up and down the, the water flow. The reason, I'm gonna have to do something about my hair, Travis. Does anybody have a hair band? Thank you, Jennifer. <laughs> there we go. All right, now we're talking. Um, the reason that matters is because in the Amazon, there are no roads. So you get in and out of places either by flying on a small airplane or by boat. The 45,000 people that lived on the edges of this river uh, were going to be affected because as you created this enormous dam over a river that doesn't really run, it flows, it meanders through the landscape lazily only half of the year because the other half, it doesn't rain. So as they were gonna build a reservoir, this was gonna flood an area about the size of Vancouver, metropolitan Vancouver. Below the dam, the river was going to dry out to a trickle. And the people that lived along the edges were going to become isolated. So the government of Brazil came up with this big plan. Um, they were going to move the indigenous communities into cities and towns. And now these people that had never gone to school or held a job or even had an understanding of money were going to go from being really independent and self-sufficient to becoming the lowest you know, rung in the ladder. After traveling all day to get there, um, the chief of the village assigned me to live with one of the families. And they showed me to their little home and they gave me a hammock in a corner. And I was so exhausted that I just wrapped myself up in a blanket and fell asleep. And sometime in the middle of the night, you know, it's pitch black and I don't know if this has ever happened to you, but I, I woke up and I had no idea where I was. But I could feel that there were people around me and I could hear them talking and I could feel them touching me over my blanket. And in the morning when I asked, they said, oh, the family, they were just so worried that you didn't have your husband or your children, and you might wake up and think that you're alone. So they were keeping me company. In the morning, um, I started meeting people and going around the village, and the first thing that I learned is how people say hello in their language. They say, me komene. 
And it means hello, but it also has a deeper meaning. It means I see you and I am accountable to you. Because in a village of 150 people, the survival of everybody depends on everybody else. And so you have to be accountable for your behavior. I also went and visited with the shaman. And this was interesting because in the morning, mothers bring their children to the little nursing station. And you know they get their pill or their shot or whatever they need. And then they get on another line and they go visit the shaman just for good measure. You know, he'll smudge him or do whatever to make sure that they're healthy. And I asked the shaman, you know, about his life in the community. And he said to me, my job, as well as the job of the chiefs in the village, is the important job of dreaming about the future of our community. Dreaming about our collective prosperity as we go forward. And he said, you know the problem with you white people? is that there's nobody in your community dreaming about your future. All you dream about is stuff. That really struck a chord with me. One of the things that I realized as I started working with these remote indigenous people is that the concept of money doesn't even exist in many of them. They just don't have it. So it forced me to start thinking about our own relationship with money. You know, it's our invention. Somehow we let it rule every aspect of our lives. We measure our capability, our worth, by how we compare to how much other people make, by how big our house is, and those are our dreams. I started thinking, you know, there's got to be another way of relating to each other and relating to nature. One afternoon, I was standing in the middle of the village, and all of a sudden I saw a group of women coming up from the river. And this was not unusual. You know, these people are so tidy, so clean. They go and bathe in the morning, and then they go back to the river at night before they go to bed, and everybody bathes. As they got closer to me, I realized that one of them was carrying a tiny little baby, a newborn. And I thought, wow, they just took this baby down to the river for its first bath. It's an important bath because it's a ritual bath that ties the fate of that baby to the fate of the river forever. And I, of course, had totally missed it. So at this point, I'm thinking, Wow, you know, in the morning I better get cracking, find the mom, and ask her if she can bring the baby back down to the river so I can make a few pictures. But when we woke up in the morning, we woke up to the news that the baby had not survived the night. It had died. That's, that's so many babies in, you know, in these remote villages, they just don't, don't live very long. And I was starting to feel sorry for myself, you know, thinking, wow, I, I really wish that they had sent somebody with a little more experience, somebody that could understand subtle the nuances of a community to be ahead of the game, right? When out of the corner of my eye, I saw somebody coming towards me. And when I turned around, I saw that it was the mother of the baby. And she was sobbing. And she was marching right, right towards I was standing. And she had something in her arms. This woman, in her sorrow, had gone and she had dug up the body of her baby. And she was carrying it around. And it was covered in mud. All of her was dirty and she had a machete in her hand and with a blunt edge she was hitting her forehead like this as she was screaming and there's blood everywhere. I just stood there paralyzed, you know, she's coming right at me. And all I could think about were my own children back home and how would I feel if somebody shoved the camera in my face when I just lost my baby. So I didn't take any pictures. A few months later we learned that the Belomonte Dam had been approved and construction was to begin immediately. And I thought about the people in the village and how they had trusted that I was going to tell their story and how I failed at my job. For me, this first assignment will always be my biggest failure because I really didn't have the courage to stand up for the things that need to be done. Jennifer Sandoval and I were just talking about how going forward to change the culture of our planet, we are all going to have to invest ourselves with a special kind of courage to be that asshole that speaks up. <laughs> and tells people, you know, it's not okay to throw plastic in the ocean, it's not okay to drink from plastic bottles, you know, to stand up for the kind of planet we want to live in. I suppose, you know, after this fail assignment, it's, it was a real blessing because it gave me that, that true north, the compass that had guided my entire career, to actually have a life invested in purpose. Since then, and I want to give a shout out to Lisa Day and 20th Century Fox, because National Geographic has been my passport to explore the world. 130 countries and many, many remote communities. 
where through the lens of my camera, I've had the opportunity to explore both the beauty and the tragedy of our natural world. And, you know, faced with the innumerable threats facing our shared humanity, I actually find a glimmer of hope. And that is, it doesn't matter where I've been, whenever you spend time with people that live close to the land, they seem to be a lot more content and fulfilled. They feel like more complete human beings. And it is because they're not measuring their worth by how much they own, but where they fit in their community. And that got me thinking into this idea of enoughness. How much is enough? How much do you need to feel enough so that you can give back? In Hawaii, um, where I did a story for National Geographic, I had the opportunity to explore this idea a little more. I met the gentleman in the back. Uh, his name is Keoni Nunez. He is a master of cacao. It's the ancient art of Hawaiian tattooing. He told me by the 1970s, nobody in Hawaii remembered how to do it. So he actually had to fly to New Zealand to learn from the Maori and then bring it back to Hawaii where he teaches it today. And he said to me, when I'm tapping on somebody's skin, they use this little instrument that they dip in ink and then he creates this masterpiece. And the person who's receiving the tattoo has no say in the design. You know, he designs it based on a conversation he has with you. And I thought, you know what, this would be a really cool opportunity for me to get a tattoo. And then I realized, you know, if you look at the guy over there, he's got his entire face. <laughs> I thought, maybe, maybe not. <laughs> uh, but Keoni said to me, when I tap on somebody's skin, it's like I'm giving them a second skin that reminds them of who they really are, reminds them of where they came from. And the tap, 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 tap of that instrument is like my ancestors speaking to me from thousands of years ago. He said that when he was a little boy, he grew up in this, you know, this shack on the beach in Oahu. He got to go surfing with his friends every day, speak his language, you know, grow up in one of the most beautiful beaches in the world. And he thought he had everything. He said it was not until people came from the mainland and they said, oh my God, you live in a shack? You're poor. It had never occurred to him that he was missing out on anything. And that to me is like, wow, you know, there's, there's something there. Here in British Columbia, um, we have an enormous number of First Nations. Uh, this is uh, Chief uh, Reuben George from the Tsleil-Waututh First Nation, and he told me that for the First Nations, there is no difference between the crow, the bear, the cloud, the river. We're all made from the same stuff by the ancestors a long time ago. And he said, the interesting thing about it is that they don't feel like the land belongs to, to them. You know, we belong to the land. And that doesn't have anything to do with land ownership, but how we relate to the natural world around us. One of the most inspiring people that I've met on this coast is this gentleman. His name is uh, Steve Lawson. He lives on Wiccaninish Island off of Tofino. And he invited me to photograph him because he was diagnosed with leukemia and he knew he was going to die. But he had been building a boat on Wiccaninish from driftwood that he had been collecting for 40 years. He built his house the same way with his wife. And he told me the story of this boat and how he would wait for months, even years, for the perfect piece of driftwood to make a plug or a rib or a plank for this vessel. And I'm going to show you this, and then I'll tell you a little more about Steve. What I was thinking is just uh, having you sit here where I am and just do a wide-angle perspective. Once again, I love this photo. Let me give you a copy. <laughs> People would call us an environmental activist. You know, they put those labels on you, but really we're, we're, we're just people responding to a situation. That's really beautiful, Steve. I call myself an ethnographic photographer because I specialize in photographing indigenous people and their context in nature. How I define myself in my own mind, of course, is as a conservationist, first and foremost, and photography just happens to be one of the tools that I use 
it's an interesting tool because it's one that allows me to have a microphone to express my ideas. Tofino is where the road ends, basically, on this island. And it's just a quaint little fishing village that grew up into a tourist town. If you want to keep going, then you have to get on a boat. And that's where the real magic begins. Tofino has been the, the birthplace of the environmental movement in British Columbia. For myself as a photographer, one of the things that I've been focusing on over the last few years is something that I call enoughness. And it's just learning to live with less. <laughs> There was a time when I just, I had the opportunity to leave it all behind, and I did, and um, I've never regretted any of that. <laughs> when I photograph people like Suzanne and Steve, it's because they exemplify, they represent what enoughness is all about. For the last four decades, five decades almost, they've been fighting the logging industry and the fishing industry and the fish farms. Okay, to look at the directions, right? Can see the directions right there. People, the environmental movement has been about the land and the animals, but it really is about people, especially people that really intersect with nature. You know, that's that point of collision where these two forces come together. 25 years ago, when we were going to jail to try to stop the logging of the old growth forest here, this place was hell on earth. We actually have come a long way from that point. I don't think you can uh, give up hope. You know, humanity is capable of great wisdom. When we really look at, at what's important, we know exactly what it is. Conservation is a puzzle where many pieces have to fit together to make things work. For me, the choice of being a photographer is just to become a piece of the puzzle. And that piece, of course, is the visual communications. In the absence of that, for me, photography means nothing. give a shout out to Real Water Productions uh, out of Squamish. They made this piece for me and of course you all know that that was a promo piece for Sony and uh, when Sony asked me to do this I said I don't want to do it you know I don't want to be a camera loudmouth uh, but if you guys want to do something on sustainability and the environment I'd be pleased to do it <laughs> and that's that's what came out. In the in the northern reaches of our planet in places like Greenland uh, climate change is already a reality. I had the opportunity to travel there a couple of years ago on assignment for National Geographic. And the first thing I learned is that uh, the Inuit people, they're not afraid of the cold like we are. They actually welcome when the temperature drops and the sea freezes, and then they can use it as a highway to go to their hunting grounds. And of course, they, they have this unique relationship with the Greenlandic Inuit Huskies. Uh, they've been you know, relying on these dogs for 4,000 years to actually make a living and they need them to travel sometimes hundreds of kilometers to the edge of the sea ice where they can hunt. And it was there that spending time with people like Nemanik Shuk Robinson, you know, looking at the face of a giant glacier, he said to me, this to me is cathedral, mosque, church, sanctuary. And there's a spirituality in nature. I think for a lot of us, when you step into the forest, I mean, that's where you feel that your religion is. And at least that's the way that it is for me. And that is another element of enoughness, finding your own spirituality in your relationship with nature. And of course, not all is well up in the Arctic.
for those of you who are familiar with uh, with this little piece of footage, um, it was a huge learning experience for us because we didn't know when we put it up on social media that it was going to go viral. And it was about a week long of being in a fast spin cycle and washing machine uh, assaulted by media and then people appropriating the story and telling it in a different way. It didn't matter. At the end of the day, uh, this photograph had almost 2 million likes on on Instagram just in the first four or five days since we posted it and it went on to become the most widely shared climate change story of um, 2017. For me, what it was, it was just a way to invite audiences to imagine what a future of climate change is going to look like, not just for polar bears, but for us as well. And I think, you know, despite all the controversy that this image caused, that's what we did. For a few days, people were thinking about climate change in a different way. Ah, that's not how I want us to remember the Arctic. The Arctic is a majestic, amazing place. And just the day before yesterday, Canada actually passed a law to protect the central Arctic from fishing. So that's a big deal. And hey, Canada. <laughs> um, this is how I want us to remember the Arctic. It really is a place worth fighting for. place. Um, so very selfishly, I started uh, my career as a photographer thinking that I was going to be a wildlife photographer just because I love spending time with animals. That's just my own selfish reason. You know, creatures like this, what's not to love, right? But early on, I realized that it takes an enormous commitment to be a wildlife photographer. And as a mother of three, I realized that maybe it was not for me. But also, I learned that animals don't always want to have their picture taken. You're gonna get me. Ah! <laughs> ah! <laughs> I know, crabs are feisty. Uh, and as much as I love making pictures like this, as, as a marine biologist, it actually took me 20 years to start a career in underwater photography. It's not the easiest entry point into photography. And I was really lucky to, to you know, meet Paul Nicklin, who's taught me everything I know about underwater photography so that I can go and spend time with animals like this. And, you know, learning underwater photography is not easy. I, know, I can't take yourself too seriously. I actually love putting all my cameras in a box and sending them back to National Geographic with a little note that says, they were great, they just need cleaning. <laughs> But seriously, um, for me, it has been the relationship with people, and especially people in coastal communities, when you start realizing that our oceans 
are our treasure. Fish is gold. Fully one billion people on this planet depend on fish for their survival every day. And if we all take one big breath, I feel good, let's take another one. That second breath was brought to you courtesy of the ocean. It can only do that for us if it's alive. It's really important that we keep our oceans living. For Paul and for me, the privilege of spending most of our life underwater in remote parts of the world really woke us up to the responsibility of doing more than just taking pictures. We were on assignment uh, here off the coast of the Pacific Northwest doing a story for National Geographic on something called the blob. This was an, an unusually large body of warm water that developed from Southern California all the way to Alaska. And the reason it was created is because the big storms that come from the north, from the Aleutians, didn't blow that winter. The jet stream is changing its shape and it's changing the patterns of weather all around the planet. Well, this big blob in some places was seven degrees warmer than it, has, than it usually is. We were photographing thousands of dead sea lions. One single day, we photographed 30 sea otters that had ingested uh, toxic algae and were brought to the beach paralyzed. They couldn't move and they were dying. And I remember photographing a wool field that was suffocating in anoxic water and just couldn't do it anymore. You know, I just inflated my BCD, floated to the surface and thought, you know what, we have to do more. And trust me, I really wanted to retire after a great career in photography. We decided to create Sea Legacy and we didn't know how big it was going to get so quickly. But I want to share with you um, a little bit of what we do. The ocean is like a kaleidoscope. It's always moving with color and gesture and light. And it's never the same twice. It's always different. It has the highest biodensity of life on Earth, way more than any terrestrial habitat. There is an entire new, dark, complicated world. And this world is the engine of our planet. Our own existence depends on a healthy ocean. Every other breath that a human being takes comes from the sea. Without the ocean, our planet wouldn't survive. It wouldn't function. It wouldn't run. When I began, I just wanted to make pretty pictures, you know, beautiful images. But um, along the way, there was somewhat of an evolution. I began to see a lot of problems occurring in the world's oceans, things that may not have been evident to most people. For most people, the experience of the ocean is from the beach, where it looks beautiful and it looks perfect. But there's a thin blue line that separates what we perceive and what we see from what the reality is. Once you go below this very thin molecular curtain of the surface, everything changes. In the last 50 or 60 years, we've lost 90% of the big fish in the ocean. For every swordfish pulled out of the North Atlantic, 10 to 12 blue sharks come with it. And day after day, week after week, year after year. We've lost half the coral reefs in this planet. You know, think about that. Half the coral reefs are gone. We have lost ice in the Arctic. We've lost ice shelves in Antarctica. And when you see all this life and how it is connected to ice, you realize that we will lose all levels of this ecosystem. As a photojournalist, I sort of felt a sense of, of responsibility and a sense of urgency to begin turning my lens towards those things. I wanted it to be more like war photography. If we're ever going to change people's behaviors, if we're ever going to be able to change people's perceptions, that's only going to start with an emotional connection. And that's going to happen through photography. The idea to use photography to rally for conservation is not a new idea. It was born in the 1800s when photographers went out to Yellowstone and brought back images to Washington, D.C. And that gave birth to the first national parks. Photography has that kind of power. Images coming from the ocean are barely, barely 70 years old, and yet it's most of our planet. 
15% of the terrestrial portion of the planet has been protected. Less than 2% of the ocean has the same level of protections. You have to have these replenishment zones. The ocean can heal itself with protection. If we just do that little bit, you know, give it a little protection, it's an investment in everybody's future. All of these pictures have more power than scientists or voices or anything else to open the world's eyes to the sea. Vision is what drives humans. It's the power of this visual communication that's at the core of Sea Legacy. We want to send photographers out there to the farthest reaches of the oceans where the story is being told. And we want to bring back stories of hope and messages for how this can be done. We still have 50% of the coral reefs. We still have 10% of the sharks left. It's not good, but it's not over. I would hope that the work that we create will compel people to do something about this. We have a small window of opportunity to act, and the solutions are simple. We know what we need to do. We need to show everybody what's at stake. We need to rally soldiers of support. We just need the visual assets to do it. The hope is that our images, that the storytelling can help ignite. To convince the unconvinced. It's the first step in the process of change. I really want to tell you more about Sea Legacy because it was an idea that happened, I think, just when the world needed it. Um, have you ever heard the word ikigai? It's a Japanese word and it means uh, the thing that you love doing uh, matches the thing that you're good at and it actually pays you to do it, but it's also what the world needs. <laughs> and it kind of came about that way. Paul and I just started posting on Instagram and the reaction we got from people, especially young people, has been truly astonishing. So today we have uh, daily access to about nine and a half million followers and through the National Geographic Instagram feed to about 150 million people every day. And the thing about the environmental movement, uh, for those of us who have been doing it for a long time, is that the, the, the entry point was really high. You had to have a PhD or you had to be educated in order to you know, enter into the debate on the envir environment. And a lot of people just have this intellectual barrier. They don't know enough to actually make a statement on environmental values. Photography, on the other hand, is a lower entry, po entry point. We're all photographers, we all carry our device, and it really has been amazing to watch so many people engage at that level. And so it started with likes and shares and comments, and pretty soon we realized that we had enough of a critical mass to actually run campaigns. And so we started doing that. Just in the last month, um, Gen uh, Governor Jerry Brown signed into law a law to ban drift nets off the coast of California. I know. They've been trying for 10, 20 years to do it, you know, and people just get jaded with the negative environmental narrative. Well, Paul spent one day diving off the coast of California. We planted a mole in one of the fishing boats, and I didn't bring the video because I don't want to go over my half hour, but um, it really galvanized people, and we collected about 200,000 signatures. We printed them, big stack of paper, sorry, environmental footprint, but we delivered those to the uh, California legislature. And it literally took four months to pass it into law. It's amazing the power of social media to do this. Uh, I'm gonna close my presentation um, by sharing with you uh, something that I've been thinking about for a long time. And it really is that the biggest mistake we've made as environmentalists is just assume that somebody else is going to do something to fix our environment. That either our government gives a shit or corporations are responsible. And I think we're all coming to the realization that that's not gonna happen. And so I came up with an acronym, now that I'm Canadian. Uh, it's uh, someone else is likely fixing it, eh? <laughs> 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 Gotta get the slang right. <laughs> As a reminder that really nobody else is coming to the rescue. Each and every one of us, we're gonna have to wear an, our invisible spandex suit and be the superheroes of our own story. And that means standing up every day and being an obnoxious loudmouth to speak for the kind of planet that we wanna live in. Because Folks, we are damn close. You know, for those of us that are looking at this from the front lines, it is getting scary. You know, there's no more time to dilly-dally on this. I want to close with a thought, and this is something that I learned from an old lady uh, many years ago. She said to me, you know, money 
your personal resources are like a river that runs through your life. And sometimes it runs like a torrent, you know, like a waterfall. Sometimes it just trickles. But that's not the key point about money. It's how we channel it, how we use our resources for the kind of planet that we want to live in that really matters. When you match your resources to your highest aspirations, that's when change really happens. So I encourage you to do that in your own circle of influence, in your work every day, because when the day comes that we're all able to look around at each other and with clear and honest eyes say, I am accountable to you. I am doing everything I can. That's the day that sustainability will become a reality. Make a minute to you all. Thank you.